God's word. I hope you're excited about God's word. Finishing our series called The Culture. We're talking about our values as a church. Need to review before we get into the final two values. First of all, the block church. We exist to revive our city one block at a time. What's that mean? Here's what it means. We want to see people give their life to Christ, come back to Jesus. That's salvation. All right, that's number one, salvation. The secondly is we want to practice saturation. What's that mean? We want to be in as many neighborhoods as possible, which means we're multiplying. It's why we're multi-site. We want to be Starbucks, but taste like La Cologne. Does that make sense? All right, and then lastly, uh, we want to be known for our service, how we serve our community. We've got things like Serve Saturdays, the Trunk or Treat event, uh, serving on Sundays. We want to be known for how we serve our city and each other. So reviving our city, we do that by salvation, saturation, and service. Now, how does that fit within the culture? How does that fit within our values? Well, values would kind of be like the vehicle that gets us to our mission. Uh, for instance, if you like bowling, if you bowl, uh, you know that the goal is to knock down as many pins as possible. Well, the values are like bumpers. And as we're rolling, trying to accomplish our mission, the values, our culture, it kind of bounces the ball or the bowling ball from going in the gutter and it helps us accomplish our mission. That's what values are. You get it? it? It keeps us aligned. It keeps us going forward. That's why these are important. So I want to review our eight values we already have and then finish with our final two. Here's the first one. You and I, we are passionate believers, which means we love Jesus and we show it. That's what we do. You saw people worshiping. You experienced clapping and joy and love and friendship and hugs. Man, we love Jesus and we're over the top in our expression. We're excited, man. We, we create an atmosphere for people to know God. We're passionate believers. Number two, we are practicing unity. That's what we're doing. We celebrate our differences and we're seeking understanding. All right, so, so we're going, hey, like, like man, we, we celebrate and recognize that you are different, and we don't go, oh, no, we're not different. We love that. We celebrate that, but also comes with some conflict and some tension, so we're seeking understanding. We celebrate, and we're practicing unity. Number three, we're development-driven. What that means is I'm not where I want to be, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be. I'm on my way, and I'm studying, and I'm growing, and I'm in community to develop and be all that I'm meant to be to reach my highest potential. All right, number four, we are authentic community, which means we're not just high-fiving and going to games together and checking in church and checking out. No, we are together and we're known. We're walking together. We're crying together. If I'm hurting, you're hurting, right? We're in it together. We are together and known. Number five, we're ready investors, which means we're, we live to give. We're looking to sow. We're excited about giving not just to, but through our church. We're invested here, right? And we're seeing, hey, Christmas is coming. Opportunity opportunities to sow into people in need. Man, I'm a ready investor. Number six, I'm a responsible owner, right? I'm not just a renter. I'm an owner. My city, my responsibility. My, my church, my responsibility. If it's broken, I'm going to fix it. You understand? All right, we are responsible owners. Number seven, we're risk takers, which means we spell faith risk, which means I have a posture and a spirit of yes. God, what you say, I'll go even if it's crazy. My spirit is yes, yes, yes. And sometimes that looks like risk, but faith is best experienced from a place of risk. And then lastly, we are always multiplying, which means we're already thinking about where we're going next, right? We are embracing mission over preference. We know that we're going to reach more people as we start more churches. And so we are launching on February 9th, our next location in Passion. Come on, somebody. South Philly, Passion Square. All right, so that's what we're doing. That's why we do what we do. And I can't wait for January, I think, 5th, Vision Sunday, where I'm going to tell you where we're going after that. All right, so, man, I'm excited. That's our values. This is what helps us accomplish our mission. Now, we got two more today. All right, and, and are you ready to finish? Are we ready to complete? Are we ready to go home today? All right, all right, here's number nine, and let me remind you, these are just in numerical order. They're all number one in our hearts. I'm gonna give you a gift at the end of the service, a little culture card that you can take with you. But number nine, we are pursuing excellence. Excellence means that we honor God and we inspire people. Let's break that down further. 
We give our best because God gave us his. It's our privilege to give our greatest effort, attitude, and focus. It's our privilege. We get to. We get to serve. We get to show up. We get to offer our best because God gave us his best. Let me prove it to you. In the scriptures, in Psalm, the Bible says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. That's beautiful language, isn't it? Okay, so if you look at that, like how many just, I love living in the city. Okay, I love uh, the idea of the fact that snakes and weird bugs and animals are not going to kill me or eat me. I don't have to worry about that. Praise God for that. Trash might kill me, but snakes won't. All right, and so I love that. I love the idea of seeing uh, beautiful buildings and architecture and lights. I think that all defines and explains God in a beautiful way that he gave men and women ability to create. I think that's great, right? But like there's also something powerful, right, about uh, being in nature. There's something powerful about the ocean. There's something powerful when you're rolling up to an island and there's teal water and mountains in the background. Like it's just stunning. It's beautiful. Trees and mountains and starry nights and shooting stars. And what God did was he said, I'm going to creatively give you my best because I love you the most. And I would even venture to say that God loves humans the most out of all his creation. So he created everything for us that we might steward it well, love it well, and experience the best of it. So like God absolutely painted and created his best for us, it would be a natural response to offer our best back to him. If we go to Genesis, the scriptures tell us God created mankind, that would be you and I, in his own image, in the image of God. That's fascinating. Stop and think about this, that God created humans in his own image. He didn't create animals. He didn't create the ocean. He didn't create uh, the sky or anything like that, or robots. He created you and I in his image. He created the male and female. He created them. This is important. It's necessary for you to remember that God created, the creator created you and I in his image, which means he must think a whole lot about you. And if you take that even further, what's even more fascinating and remarkable is God creates man out of dirt and dust. Have you ever felt like your life was in a whole bunch of dirty and dusty places, that it was broken and meaningless and it was turning out to be nothing? Well, I want you to know that God in his creation and in his excellence always redeems those who are willing and want to be redeemed. And sometimes he redeems people who don't even know they want to be redeemed. And God took dust and dirt and he created something beautiful, which means God redeems the dirt of our lives to produce something gold through our lives. And so he creates from dust and dirt, he creates man, which is wonderful. And then from the man's rib, he creates woman. And some would say doubly refined, like the glory of man, right? I mean, all the married men know exactly what I'm talking about. We're better because of the wives in our lives, right? And so it's just this beautiful image that God redeems and that he can create something out of nothing. He gave us his best. How could we not offer him our best? And then if you look at the scriptures in Romans, the Bible says that God gave Jesus Christ, his son, to the world. Men's sins can be forgiven through the blood of Jesus when they put their trust in him. And I'm excited that today at every location, somebody already has or somebody will put their trust in Jesus today. Sins will be forgiven and the dirt of their lives is going to turn into something excellent. That's good news. Right, but if you think about this, God gave his best in Jesus. This is better than mountains. This is better than islands. This is better than teal crystal waters. This is better than food. Even though you can't imagine that, Jesus saving love, relationship with Christ, there's nothing better, and God gave us the best. So why is it that so many times we show up late to things that matter? Why is it so many times you and I give a half-hearted effort instead of a full devoted mission? Why is it that people don't get the best of us, they get the rest of us? Why is our family constantly fighting for our attention because we're on the phone or because we're distracted by media? Uh, Is it possible that there are areas in our life where we've not been excellent? 
And today I hope that it, this might serve as a reminder that God offered and regularly redeems and gives you his best. I think that we should be people who offer our best. I think we should show up on time if it's not in our practice. I think we should learn to show up early if it's not in our practice. I understand if you got 14 kids and you're trying to get everybody ready and sometimes you show up a little bit late, but man, maybe we can start practicing a little bit early. And I'm not saying that you won't miss it at times, but I'm just saying God gave us his best. I might need to step it up and level up. I think that Christians should be the hardest workers in the office. I think that Christians should be the most devoted people in their world, in their neighborhood, at their school. Are you offering the world your best? I think that the church should be full of creative people expressing their gifting and offering stuff back to God, not reluctantly and not begrudgingly, but saying, God, you've given me salvation. I will offer you an excellent response. Now I understand that there's hurt. And I understand that sometimes stuff happens and we've been hurt and we need seasons of rest. But at some point, you got to get off your high knee and you got to offer God your best. At some point. I get it. And I want to say this, that if you're a visitor or if you are new to Christ or if you are not a Christian, these behaviors we believe are kingdom behaviors. And I'm not calling you to that standard as I'm calling the Christians in this room to that standard, but I'm saying lean in because we are supposed to make our world a more excellent place. Can you give God a praise and an amen for that? Excellence. You know, excellence leads us to places. If you look at Daniel... Uh, chapter 6, he was an influential person. He was a person of prayer, a person of leadership. And the Bible says that soon Daniel proved himself more capable than all the administra other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire, excuse me, empire. The entire empire. I think that's important because excellence, friends, it leads to influence. Excellence leads to influence. Did you ever wonder, why is it that I'm not being influential in my life? Uh, why don't I rally or garner the support that maybe I should? Why am I not getting promotions? Uh, why is my work not being recognized? And sometimes God can keep us in hiding for seasons and can keep us down because we may not be able to handle the success he wants to give us or that we want. However, it's possible that sometimes we don't have influence because we're not practicing excellence. We're turning our work in half-heartedly. We're not offering the best of us. And I want to be very clear about something. Excellence is not perfection. My excellence and my best effort is different than your excellence and your best effort. But the effort must be the same. The effort should be the same. I'll produce differently than you. And you'll produce differently than me, but together, a beautiful harmony, a beautiful symphony of sounds of worship. Do you understand that what you do is worship to God? Are you offering your best? That's why resting is important. It's why taking a Sabbath, it's why resting is necessary because if you're always going, if you're always doing, if you're always working, if you're always striving, then you won't be able to offer your best because you're exhausted. Sometimes your best effort and your most excellence is you doing nothing on a Saturday but watching your kids and laying it down. We've got to practice both. I think this is important, First Chronicles. David, uh, King David desired to build a temple. He desired to build God a house. But there was too much blood on his hands because of the wars that he fought. God said, you're not going to. But he says this. He says, this is the house of the Lord God. And this is the altar of burnt offerings for Israel. He said, and David prepared iron in abundance. Somebody say abundance. Say that with me. Abundance. That's important. For the nails of the doors of the gates and for the joints and bronze in abundance beyond measure. Cedar trees in abundance for the Sidonians and those from Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. See, what I'm saying is this, is the house of God deserves excellence because it leads to influence. It honors people and it represents God well. 
What we offer an atmosphere of excellence because it honors people. We do our best to get you out on time because it honors people. We do our best to offer an atmosphere and a culture where you want to bring your kids to our children's ministry. We're not where we want to be, but we're working hard to get there. I mean, people so many times, they might not experience God because they showed up at a church where nobody greeted them, nobody said hello, nobody cared to offer a cup of coffee, and the kids' ministry was dirty, and there was nothing for the children's to do but watch a movie. That's not what we're trying to do here. In abundance, more than enough, we want to offer great experiences that are excellent so that people would be drawn in to experience the love of God. And here's what excellence does as well. So David couldn't build the kingdom, but he says to Solomon, his son, he says, I know you're young and inexperienced. Now, he's getting ready to give him an assignment, but please understand that being inexperienced does not mean that you can't participate. Uh, Experience helps us get better, and experience gives us wisdom, but just because you're inexperienced doesn't mean you can't give a sacrificial, excellent effort. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room You just got to be the person who's teachable and who's willing to offer your best for God to use you. That's where you say amen. Amen. Okay. Maybe I got so many smart people here that they're just like, I'm the best at everything. I'm the smartest at everything. I know how to parent. I know how to invest. I know how to buy properties. I know how to do it all. No, that's not. Okay, then we should be excited about that. And the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent. Famous and glorious throughout all countries. I will now make preparations for it. So David made abundant preparations before his death. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord, my God. What am I saying? Biblical excellence casts clear vision and holds a higher standard for the glory of God and development of his people. This is important. Because what David does is he says, son, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be able to build this thing, okay? But I'm trusting you who's inexperienced, but I'm not worried about that because I know you'll carry the heart and the culture of the way that I've built this kingdom. And he's saying, I'm going to cast clear vision to you. This temple needs to be excellent, This temple that we're going to build for God needs to be magnificent. I want you to give it all your effort, but I'm going to cast clear vision and I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. And some people, when they're not giving their best effort and don't want to be held to a higher standard, run from accountability and run from opportunity to grow because they're often making excuses to not be held to a higher standard of accountability. And so in this church and in our culture, while we must always lead with relationships and while we don't always get it right, we desire feedback and to hold each other to a higher standard. If you're living in a way that's not the best for your life, I'm expecting somebody who loves you and who has a relationship with you to come alongside you and say, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. If you're purposely showing up late constantly and you're offering bad work to your team that you serve on or you're not preparing for group if you're leading it or, or man, you're just in and out, not giving your... Somebody's going to say something out of love. Why? Because excellence casts vision and calls us to a higher standard. And I want to be a church where people walk in and go, man, I had an excellent experience. And because of that, they thought about me. I don't know Christ and I'm not sure about Christianity and all the things that they say on the news about Christians today. Man, I'm not sure. But man, when I encountered them, I saw hardworking people. I saw people who were on time. I saw people who loved me and cried with me and prayed with me. I saw people who weren't getting anything out of me and that was okay. They wanted to give back to me and I didn't even know them. Do you understand what I'm saying? We live in a day and age where we can no longer take for granted the culture of Christianity. But we're not necessarily living in a full-blown Christian culture. So we've got to be on our game. People got to have experience with us and go, man, Christians aren't so bad after all. But the reason so many of us get looked at like that is because we're flippant with our words and we're not excellent with our work. We're pursuing excellence at the block church. 
Here's number 10. We are experience makers. In other words, we create impactful experiences. Now, I forgot to do this for the first one, but I want to say it all together because the word we is necessary here because whether you like it or not, you are helping create impactful or non-impactful experiences. So I want to say this together. We create impactful experiences. Thank you for the four people on site who said that. Because you don't believe it yet, but I'm going to help you believe it. But let's say it together in faith. We create impactful experiences. What does that mean? You and I are embracing every moment as an opportunity to help our world experience God through what we create and how we behave. Now, this is similar to excellence and why they're together, but they are different. Because creating an experience and an atmosphere... It coincides with giving your best effort, but you have to understand that it's a different posture. It's a different energy. I'm an experience maker. For instance, we write our own music here. We create our own content here. We want you to have a specific, clear encounter with God and tell the stories of this house. When I preach, almost all the time we're doing our own sermon series and, and I'm writing my own sermons. Why? Because I don't want you to have a regurgitated revelation or half-hearted piece of thrown up steak from somebody else's treasure with God. I want you to get something fresh and new and when you walk away going, did he read my text messages? Was he in my email? No, I don't have that sort of ability. What I do have is the Holy Spirit. And while I might not be able to offer you silver and gold, I will offer you the power of God when I get with God and create an experience. And what I want for all of us is to have our own experiences with God that we can then offer to others as an experience from God. And now every time you're in a service, you may not hear a direct rhema sermon word from God for your life, but for the most part, man, often you should go, mm, that convicts me, or oh, that moves me. And that's because we're experience makers. Man, when you come and you worship, it's because somebody worshiped before you worshiped. When you experience the presence of God, it means somebody created an atmosphere, an opportunity. Somebody worked hard to set up chairs and somebody greeted. And I want to say thank you to all of our set up and tear down people. You're not just setting up and tearing down. You are creating an experience. You're praying over chairs. You're creating an atmosphere. You're turning a catering hall or a club or an old church or a cafetorium or wherever we go next, you're turning that into a holy sanctuary for God to move. Thank you to our greeters who greet people and smile and love people and hold doors. You're not just holding doors for people to walk into a room. You're holding doors for people to walk into the presence of God. We're experience makers. Thank you for the prayer team that prays over seats and over people, leading people to Christ every week. Thank you for production and worship who shows up well before some of you are awake to set an atmosphere for the Spirit of God to move. We're experience makers. That's what we do. It's who we are. And you can take that into your world. You can create an experience in your home before breakfast as you have devotions with your family. You, you can take this into your workplace and create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit is there, where you can give people words of knowledge and breathe life over them. You're an experience maker. And it's important for people to have experiences so that they can know miracles. Look at Elisha. I think this is powerful. He's getting ready to perform a miracle, and he says, now bring me someone who can play the harp. While the harp was being played, the power of the Lord came upon Elisha. Before he performed a miracle, he created an experience where the presence of God rushed in. And we don't always need harps. And we don't always need a band. We can have the presence of God when we invite him and when we're aware of it and when we recognize he's in us. But did you know that you are the harp? You are the band. You are the choir. You are the chorus. You are the inviter. You are what God uses so that people can have a moment with him. I could go over story after story of people who found us on Instagram uh, or on social media because of a hashtag. And then they looked and they said, well, this picture's not pixelated and this video actually is high quality. Maybe these people care a little bit about what they're doing. Right? right? I mean, I, I could go over store over store, people coming to the Fillmore and having an experience with God going, 
the presence. Something's different here. But somebody on their way to the film or prayed that somebody would experience that. Somebody got up at 5 a.m. or 3.30 trying to put on makeup and drink coffee. Going, I'm going to be there all day. But because you showed up, somebody experienced Christ. And that's why we hold people accountable to say, man, what you're doing matters. We're experience makers. You and I, we create experiences everywhere we go. Hey, on the subway, you can pray under your breath and say, Holy Spirit, is there someone here that I can bring to my church? Is there someone here that I can pray for? Is there someone here that I can lead to Christ? I'm an experience maker. Now, I want to ask you a question because I get it. Some of this stuff is like, man, this church is crazy, too intense for me. You know, these people are nuts. They got 10 values. <laughs> trying to put churches everywhere. Like, I like Starbucks, you know, like whatever. You know? <laughs> I was like, well, we'll help you find somewhere else, you know. Not if you like Starbucks, but if you feel like this church isn't for you. I want you to be in a local church. But I want our church, if you're, I want you to be practicing these values. Here's the beauty about the church. Here's the beauty. The Old Testament, listen to me, it illuminates Jesus on his way. The Old Testament shows us, it shows us that man's law and man perfection, it doesn't work. So we had to go through running from God and, and acting religious to experience Jesus where we understand grace. And the Old Testament has great value. There's stories and there's, there's, there's great leadership lessons. There's great principles. And it reveals and illuminates Jesus. And it also shows us that apart from God, we can do no good. But the New Testament comes along and it shows us grace. And it says because you belong, eventually you'll transform your behavior. But the block church and the kingdom of God should be a place where you can actually come in and go, you know what, I'm not even sure I believe yet, but if I belong to these people at some point, God might get to some of these behaviors. So what I'm saying is, is you don't need to change to pick up your harp and play. Wow. You just got to be you and say, God, I'm open, open up my heart. And as you do that, God will begin to transform you from the inside out. We're not a religious place. This is not a religious structure. We are a place practicing excellence and fostering experiences that people can know God. We let God do the changing. We allow people to do the accountability because we've got a mission to do. I don't have time to correct you on every step and keep my foot over your neck. That's not my job. My job is to deliver something fresh and give you an experience. I want you to carry this culture. I want you to carry the culture of practicing unity and of being a passionate believer. I want you to practice this stuff everywhere you go. So how do we become culture carriers? I want to give you just a couple small things as we go, but here's the first one. you got to be sold on the why. Like, are you sold on reviving our city one block at a time? Like I am. I'm ready to give my life for this thing. I'm not, I'm not asking every one of you and those who volunteer to give the 150 hours a week that I think about and pray about and live this thing, right? But like, it's got to be internal somewhere that like, I'm a reviver of my city. Like I'm sold on this thing. I love it. I believe in it. You got to be sold on the why. But also it's not enough to just be sold on the why. You have to embrace the how. That's where the rubber meets the road. Because a lot of people can say they're sold on the how. Oh, I love the mission, reviving our city. But then you only show up once every three months. I'm not sure you're embracing the how. I want you to be healthy. I want you to take vacations. I want you to uh, serve and to sit. I, I want you to not come to church when you're extra sick and, and watch a sermon on YouTube. I'm good with that. But like three vacations a month, man, that's not going to cut it. It's going to kill your bank account and you're not going to be strengthened by the gathering of God's people. Like, like, like at some point, I know you might be healing and resting, but at some point you got to serve. You got to learn to serve like Jesus. At some point you got to dive in and get in a group or lead a group. And at some point you got to jump and serve on a Saturday. At some point you got to embrace the how and receive the feedback and be excited over the numbers of people, the swell of people coming to Christ. You got to embrace the how. At some point it's not enough to take up a seat once every six months. 
or once every three months. I would just say, attend more than you miss and serve like Jesus and connect to people inside and outside the church. Man, that's how we do it. Also, you gotta be proud of the what? So like, I'm not saying be prideful and arrogant. I'm just using proud of the what as an example of like, man, I'm grateful for what God's done and I'm not gonna keep it to myself. I'm gonna invite people to this church. I'm gonna own a service and when I see an empty seat, I'm gonna go, that's my seat to fill. I'm not just gonna fill my seat, I'm gonna bring somebody else to fill that seat. I'm gonna invite people. I'm gonna embrace mission over preference. I'm gonna post about it and invite and, and go live and check in and I'm gonna make what I do. This is a part of who I am. I'm proud of what we're doing. I can't wait to tell people. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb covers our sins and the word of our testimony. When's the last time you testified about what God's done in your life here and invited somebody else to participate? Man, I'm preaching today. And then we got to challenge the who. Not the who's in the Grinch. That joke. But, but those who are off brand, like those who like are off mission, like you hear somebody, you know, uh, saying, oh, I don't, that doesn't matter. Or, 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 man, I don't ever invite people. Or, man, I can be late. It doesn't matter. Or, or, man, you hear prejudiced things coming out of their mouth. No, we correct that lovingly through relationship. We don't give up on people. We say, hey, you're off brand. Oh, I don't invest, man. The church is just going to squander my money. I don't trust those people and those leaders and that pastor. No, we correct people. We say, I dare you to give it a try. Right? And if you've got problems or a conflict with somebody or somebody's not acting the way they should, we're challenging the who. We're having confrontational conversations that are looking people in the eyes going, hey, we can do better. I love you. We do it through relationship, but we're challenging the who. If you're off brand, get back on. People help us to do that. And lastly, we're guarding the win. Guarding the win. Stay with me. I'm almost done. 60 seconds. But I think this one's important, extra important, because the win is right now. And like, I'm all for online church. We're going to have an online location. I think it's important, again, when you're on vacation, when you're searching for a church, when you're sick, when your kids are going nuts and you can't get them out the door, right? Like, like that's, that's the value and the benefit. It's a great way to share it and spread it to somebody who's sitting at home who won't go, needs to see it first so they can get there. But it can't be a substitute for gathering. The writer of Hebrews is telling us, hey, don't forsake gathering together. Because this is a holy moment. This is a significant moment. Like, like things are happening. Like you are being strengthened. The word of God is being planted in your soul and in your heart. Like somebody's coming with you. Somebody today walked in this church far from God and their salvation, their eternity is in the balance. We got to guard this time. Like, it's important for me to pray before I come. It's important for me to show up and fight through what little traffic there is on Sundays. It's important for me because I'm guarding the win. When I gather in groups, man, this is a great opportunity for me to mentor and develop somebody. When I'm on a team, it's a great opportunity for me to grow and learn to be like Jesus. It's an opportunity. I'm guarding the wind. These are holy, sacred moments. And for thousands of years, the church has been gathering to have holy moments. What makes us any different? We got to gather. We got to come together. Miracles happen in atmospheres like this. We got to guard the win. Can I review for you with five seconds left on my clock? Let's go from the top, man. We are sold on the why. We are embracing the how. We are proud of the what. We are challenging the who, and then we're embracing the when. These are holy moments. There's no throwaway weekend. Today, right now, somebody's life is going to transform forever. Families are going to be restored. Souls are going to be won. You have, you have no idea what's going to happen on a weekend or a group or a hangout. Guard it. I want to invite our ushers at every location. I want to invite our ushers forward. And I want to give you this gift, this culture card that I hope that you put in your car or hang up on your mirror or 
put on your dashboard or I don't know, put on your refrigerator. And as I hand those out, as this gift, man, these are the behaviors that we're practicing here at the Block Church. We're reviving our city. We've got these 10 values that I hope that you would memorize at some point in your journey here. And when you get the culture card, I would love for you to stand to your feet. I want to pray over you, and then I'll turn it over to your location, Pastor. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? It's a holy moment. It's a holy moment right now. Father, In this place, you're about to do a miracle work, the miracle of salvation, the miracle of healing. Bodies are about to be healed. Families are about to be restored. We're going to experience the tangible presence of God in this place. We love you. And I pray that every person at the Block Church and beyond, that we would carry these kingdom principles in our life like never before. Holy Spirit, overwhelm us and swell into our hearts and our souls. Ignite the power of God in our life to carry your kingdom culture everywhere we go. We love you. We believe and trust that the best for our city and our church is ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.